Amen. Well, um, last Sunday I told a little bit of a fib. Um, I said that uh, this message this week would be the last message in the series, but it turns out it's not. <laughs> um, sometimes that happens, you know, when you're studying the scripture and, and the Lord just sheds more light. So, um, so this morning's message won't be a long one, and everybody said. <laughs> um, today I'll just be venturing into Judges 16, 1 and 3, verses 1 and 3, but... Um, before I get into chapter 16 of Judges, I wanted to mention, I just wanted to mention something that uh, came to me as, as Nat and I were at home just discussing last week's message. And, um, you know, just at home, just talking, and, uh, and I just really felt the, the Holy Spirit just begin to bring to my mind something concerning uh, Samson uh, and the interaction that he had with his fellow Israelites, you know, the men of Judah. Um, see if this works. This is right. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. So, just want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, just go further into it. Just go a little bit deeper for a little bit. Um, so, as I mentioned last week, Samson. Um, well, the Philistines wanted to arrest Samson, and so they came uh, to the men of Judah. And so the men of Judah gathered like 3,000 men to arrest Samson. So they actually went to the cave of Vitam where uh, Samson was uh, chilling out, I guess. And um, they basically arrested him and they took him to the Philistines. So they basically, they handed him over to the Philistines either to appease them or to avoid a full-scale war, probably both. Um, so what I wanted to bring to your attention this morning or today is that um, they were willing to sacrifice one of their own to their enemy so as to save an entire nation and, uh, and to save an entire nation from feeling that uh, like the wrath of the Philistines, right? But Samson willingly went with them. That's the point. Samson willingly went with his brothers and he allowed himself to be tied up and delivered to the Philistines, and he allowed them to lead him to his death. Now, that wasn't the time of his death because, you know, what went down was, you know, a thousand Philistine men were killed with the jawbone of a donkey, that kind of thing. So he didn't quite, they didn't quite lead him to his death at that point. <clears throat> but Isaiah says this, said he was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Amen. And then um, this passage in John, the gospel came to my mind as well. <clears throat> it says, The chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Uh, what are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing. You know, I think Caiaphas was a Sadducee and apparently they're very rude. So he's just like, you know, you know nothing. You know, so um, uh, let me continue here. Yeah, so one of them named uh, Caiaphas, who was high priest of the Espec, says, you, you know nothing at all. You do not realise, you do not realise that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. And then John goes on to say, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So here's Caiaphas, he's the high priest that year. He prophesied, though I'm sure he didn't realize it, but he said that it is better or more expedient that one man die for the people than a whole nation perish. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were afraid that because of Jesus' influence, they thought that the Romans would come and uh, they would take away both the temple and their nation. So they had to deal with their Jesus problem, just like the men of Judah had to deal with their Samson problem. But 
What's interesting is that in 70 AD, the Romans did actually come in and take and raise the temple of Jerusalem. And then the Jewish people were scattered um, from that point on until 1948 when they came back into their land. <clears throat> so uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were intensely jealous of Jesus and his popularity so much so that they plotted to kill him. But John makes the point in his gospel that Caiaphas, though inadvertently prophesied that Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross would not only be for the Jew, but he foreshadowed the Gentile coming together as one, or as Paul put it, to create one new man in Christ, both Jew and Gentile. So what the men of Judah did to Samson is a type and shadow of Jesus, the Lamb of God, dying for the, world, for the world. And so John makes this point that Caiaphas did not say this on his, uh, did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. And I just thought that was, amen, that was amazing when I had just the, the Holy Spirit really just kind of brought that thought to my mind. So what the devil meant for evil, the Lord meant for good. Amen. So anyway, let's move forward. Oh, sorry about that. I, there, was another, there was two parts of that scripture. <laughs> okay. Chapter 16 of the book of Judges. So one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here, so they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there until, until uh, till the middle of the night. Then he got up and took a hold of the doors of the city gate, so the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all, and lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of a hill that faces Hebron. I mean, what an introduction. I mean, <laughs> what an introduction to chapter 16. You know, here's Samson in Gaza, which is a Philistine city. Uh, he sees a prostitute, spends the night uh, with her, playing cards, probably, I'm guessing. Um, but Samson is a long way from home, a long way from his father's house in Zorah. So Gaza was an important coastal town or city south in Philistine territory. And I think it was more than 64 kilometers from his home. So it was, he was a way away from home. Again, Samson did what was right in his own eyes. We see again Samson's cavalier attitude, his cavalier attitude to life. And this is shown in how he approaches women, right? So he, he sees, he wants, he takes. That's his attitude. And you know, it's not like Samson, this, this is a thought I had, it's not like Samson is even tempted to go into the prostitute's house. It's not like he's struggling with it. Like, it's not like he's struggling with, you know, a lust thing. Well, he is, so, but he has got a lust problem, but he's, it's not like he's struggling with it. <laughs> um, for him, satisfying his fleshy appetites has just become a way of life. You know, as far as right and wrong is concerned, the dilemma of should I or shouldn't I go into the prostitute's house? Um, I don't think that's even a question he's even considering. Um, you know, you've gone down a dark road when you have lost all sense of what is right and what is wrong, where your conscience is seared to the point where you are no longer soft or sensitive to your own conscience and to the leading the spirit you know Samson has this like litany of like a long list of repeatedly giving himself over to his own flesh his own sin that his conscience has become like just totally desensitized hardened to the point that going into the prostitute's house is something that he does without shame or embarrassment you know I also thought perhaps that's how he just lets off steam you know Perhaps that's how he takes the pressure off himself. You know, he's like an old broken record, stuck in a groove of his own sinful behavior. 
You know, going to the prostitute's house is, is kind of, for Samson, is kind of what we would call a coping mechanism. In other words, an idol. It's an idol in his life. You know, and I still remember as a kid, you know, you, you, just growing up in the 80s, you know, you hear about these high-profile televangelists, you know, bad-mouthing one another and falling into sexual immorality and adultery and fraud and the list goes on. And, you know, even more recently with, uh, with you know, the great Christian apologist um, Ravi Zacharias and the, and the shocking revelation about his, you know, that, that whole sexual misconduct thing. And even now I find that hard to just wrap my head around that one. But even with all of Samson's bad behavior, God is still working through Samson because God loves Samson. Remember what I said uh, last week that Samson was illustrating in his life what Israel had become as a, as a nation. They themselves were engaging in spiritual unfaithfulness to God by worshipping the false gods of all the surrounding peoples. But God loved Israel and he continued to love Samson as well. Okay. Let's move on. Um, so Samson's reputation has preceded him. He's become a little bit of a celebrity because killing a thousand men, that's a pretty big deal and destroying, you know, just destroying the Philistine crops and, and uh, just a lot of destruction that went on. He was pretty, he was starting to get a name for himself. Um, so his reputation has preceded him. So here in Gaza, um, you see these men of Gaza just surrounded the place he was and, and they were laying in wait for him all night so that at dawn they could ambush him and kill him. Well, Samson threw a bit of a spanner in the works because um, he decided that he would leave a little earlier than the morning. He got up in the middle of the night, midnight, all right? So we are told, um, we're not told actually that, that Samson knew that the Philistines lay in wait to kill him, but I don't think it mattered whether he was aware of their presence or not, because he didn't fear the Philistines. He wasn't afraid of the Philistines. If we go by his previous behavior, there is no indication that the men of the city even tried to stop him in the end, uh, to stop him to leave from leaving, but mainly because they weren't game enough to stop him. I mean, this was the same guy, once again, I'll mention it, who decimated a thousand Philistines with a donkey jawbone. That's pretty impressive. And uh, there is no indication that they were merely asleep. And Samson just tiptoed past them and then uprooted this massive heavy doors of this gate. It's pretty noisy work, you know, if you're kind of like pulling up a gate. Um, so I'm pretty sure they would have heard that. But I'd say this, any bravado that they had to kill him earlier just went up in smoke when they came face to face with him. And so I, I believe that they just kind of just let him, let him go, just let him pass, you know. And then he just uprooted that gate. So just to let them know that they could in no way trap him, he rips up this large city gate, or these doors, posts, bar, the whole thing. And, um, and I just believe they weren't going to risk a fight with Samson. And especially at night, <laughs> because they'd lose. Um, so this gate was the only way in and the only way out of the city. So in the middle of the night, he proceeds to walk out of that city with a massive gate on his shoulders. And he walks. I think I've got another, is another one. Yeah. So he basically picks up this massive gate, gate, leaves Gaza, and then he walks. What? 64 kilometers east, straight to Hebron. Right? Now, some liberal theologians, they may say, oh, look at that, uh, they, that he took the large gate to a nearby hill uh, facing Hebron, not all the way to Hebron, or, or, the, or the gate was like, it's just a small gate, you know, that was, that was easy for anyone to handle. But um, they love doing that. They kind of love to take the miraculous and just say, no, nah, it's just... That's a natural thing. Anyone could have done it, you know what I mean? But Samson is no ordinary man. That's the point. And I think the right of judges intends for this to be taken absolutely literally. So the, the writer of judges 
wants the reader to understand that this is the Spirit's power at work in Samson. So yes, that gate was that big, or those doors, and yes, he did walk that far with that gate on his shoulders, and that's like amazing. You know, it's not mentioned actually here in this passage that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, but just because it's not mentioned, it doesn't mean that the power of God was not involved. Had to be the, the presence of God, had to be the power of God to do that. Again, Samson believed that God would give him supernatural ability to do great exploits and to manifest these amazing feats of power and strength, even though it seems like he liked to take the credit for it. But it was God doing it. That's why we call Samson a man of faith, because he knew that it was God doing it. He trusted God that he would come through every time. So this has nothing to do with any kind of natural ability that he possessed, but it was about God's divine call and purpose for his life. Amen. You know, gates are mentioned everywhere in the Old Testament. Um, you know, Babylon boasted of the Ishtar Gate, you know, for, you know, the main entrance into the city of Babylon. It was very impressive. Um, but gates are mentioned everywhere in the Old Testament. And there is a Hebrew saying found in Genesis. God says to Abraham, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In, Samson, in Samson's case, he was a descendant of Abraham, and in Samson's case, he literally possessed the actual gate of his enemies. So what does it mean to possess the gate of your enemies? In Hebrew culture, gates not only protected a city, at the city gates, they would have like guards or watchmen stationed as lookouts, to, uh, lookouts to, uh, at the gate to keep an eye out for danger. But uh, and I think Ken's mentioned this as well. Um, gates also served as a place where the village elders would gather to hear complaints and settle disputes between uh, members of the community. It was a place where business was done, especially business that uh, required formalities to be observed, such as witnessing agreements. And a good example is, uh, like in uh, the book of Ruth, that's right, Boaz. Boaz, who became a kinsman redeemer. The agreement between Boaz and the closer relative was settled by exchanging uh, jandals, sandals. We call them jandals in New Zealand. Um, sandals. So there was this exchange going on. And this all took place at the gate. The gate was a place of authority where covenants were made and settled and witnessed. That's interesting. Okay, so that's very interesting, but what, what does that have to do with the phrase to possess the gate of your enemies? It's a good question. Glad you asked that question. Um, taking possession of the gate of an enemy implies exercising control over that city. It implies taking over a colony. It implies having a city, a colony, or even an entire empire yielding to the control of a colonizing outside force. The gates to a city then represented a point of power, a place of authority, a place to exercise control over that city. For example, a military conqueror would try to get control of the gate in order to enter the city more, more easily. A king who had the hearts of the elders who sat at the gate would politically control the city. A person who organized and ran commercial markets and storehouses at the gate would control the economic uh, life of the city and its surrounding villages. So, so at the gate, ideas and policies flowed along with the commerce. The, these ideas could uh, result in the rising and even the the falling of rulers and even nations. This all happened at the gate. These are all possibilities, things that, that would have happened. 
So you can say that Samson was making a very big statement by removing Gaza's gate, or the doors of that gate. He was usurping the authority of that Philistine city. You know, the name Gaza uh, in the Hebrew is the word Azza, which is loosely translated as strong city. So Samson, he was demonstrating that he was in control, not those who would try to kill him. He rendered his enemies powerless by removing the gate they were now. By removing that gate, they were now vulnerable. So he had made the city that probably boasted of its strength and power. He rendered it weak and lame. So Samson triumphed over his enemies without shedding any blood this time by possessing the gate of his enemies. You know, I marvel at the, the, the brilliance of, of God and that he has revealed the gospel in the first three verses of Judges 16. Here we see Samson surrounded by his enemies, even in his darkest hour. And at midnight, he bypasses them. He takes up this huge wooden gate, or these doors of this huge wooden gate, with the two posts and the bar, everything, and walks a long distance with it to a, to a hill that faces a place called Hebron. And you might say, okay, where's the gospel in that? Well, um, it's all right. It's at the cross that a new covenant was made. Just as they did at the gates of the city where agreements, covenants, transactions were made, sealed and witnessed. We know of the great exchange that happened at the cross, that we exchange our sin for God's righteousness when we believed in Christ. You know, today we, we look at uh, Re Reformation Day. It's the 31st of October, Reformation Day. It's Halloween as well, but we won't worry about that one. Um, and we remember Martin Luther, how he nailed his 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door in Germany. And the whole crux of the, of the Reformation, of the, of the Reformation of the Church was justification by faith. And justification is that God has declared us righteous by faith. The just shall live by faith. The gate, as I mentioned, was, was the only way in and the only way out of the city. And Jesus is the only way, is the only truth, and is the only life. No one comes to the Father except through him. says here that Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. You know, it was in the last three hours that Jesus was on the cross that the darkness descended on the land. That he cried, Tetelestai, it is finished. It was his darkest hour. And it was in that darkest hour that he accomplished all that the Father had prepared for him to do the place where he became sin, so that we might become the very righteousness of God in him. And he won a great victory, just as Samson was triumphant in his darkest hour when he took that gate in the middle of the night. You know, we know that Jesus bore a wooden cross on his shoulders, walking to a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, and the cross uh, represented um, death's authority and power over humanity. One of the most excruciating and painful deaths anyone could ever endure in ancient history. Very cruel way to, to be executed. But Samson bore that wooden gate on his shoulders. After having walked a great distance, he carried it up a hill facing Hebron. You know, we think about Jesus, how he came from heaven to earth. He came a great distance so that he could bear the cross. You know, the word, or um, well, the place Hebron is actually a significant place. Hebron means the binding friendship place. 
because it was here that Abram, or Abraham as we know him, had made an alliance, a friendship with a certain group of Amorites who in turn helped Abram rescue his nephew Lot when he was captured. And it was in Hebron that Abraham and Sarah were buried. And Hebron also served as King David's headquarters where he ruled over the tribe of Judah for several years before um, he became king over all of Israel and took Jerusalem as his capital. It was in Hebron that the Lord showed Abraham the land that his offspring would possess. So Samson placed this wooden gate on top of a hill facing the binding friendship place. The binding friendship place. It was when Jesus was lifted up and nailed on that wooden cross on the hill called Golgotha that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It was there that God was making covenant with us through Christ. It was through the blood of Christ that we have been cleansed from all sin and now we are in the binding friendship place with God. We are now in a place where God meets with us. We have been brought near through the precious blood of Christ. The covenant that God made with Christ is a binding covenant, never to be made null and void. This was a covenant made between God and Jesus, not God and us. We are recipients of that covenant. We come into that covenant through Christ because we would fail if God had made covenant with us, just as Israel failed under the old covenant. But this covenant will never fail because the blood of Jesus will never fail. And it has God's seal of approval, the Holy Spirit. And we become partakers of this new covenant through faith in Jesus. We are now under a new covenant of grace. So Jesus possessed the gate of his enemy, which was hell and death, Hades and death. Jesus conquered death through the resurrection. Scripture says, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Again, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Matthew's gospel speaks of Jesus and his authority and his power. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Amen. Jesus, he has authority over hell and the grave. Jesus conquered death in his resurrection. But Jesus was the first fruits or the first to be raised. And this would ensure that those who have died or will die in the future will also be raised at the resurrection. There is a future hope for us. As Paul said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. Looking forward to that. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we have seen, packed into those first three verses of Judges 3, we see some amazing and beautiful truths about our Lord Jesus and the finished work of the cross. And lastly, as I close, I said it was going to be a short one, that uh, Jesus said to Peter, 
And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, the ecclesia, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Amen. Ecclesia, the, the called out ones. We are the body of Christ, the called out ones. The gates of hell will not prevail against those who are called out ones, the ecclesia, because hell has no authority over us. Remember that the gate would represent a place of power and authority. Satan's authority over us has been usurped by Christ's victory on the cross. You know, we stand firm in our identity in Christ. We stand firm in that. We stand firm in our identity in Christ. And if you can take one thing, or maybe two things, away from today's message, it is this. That just as Samson was victorious over his enemies through a gate and a hill, so Christ was victorious over his enemies through a cross, a hill, and an empty tomb. Amen. We all know, as I finish up here, the uh, old rugged cross, you know, that uh, old chorus and hymn. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. Amen. That's all. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much, Lord God, for your word. We thank you so much for the message of the gospel. We thank you so much, Lord God, for uh, justification by faith today, Lord God. We thank you for the great exchange, Lord. We thank you that we are now the righteousness of God because of your substitutionary death on the cross. And you were raised to life for our justification. So, Lord God, we just thank you so much for the life of Samson and the... And the um, the types and the shadows, Lord God, the, the, the picture that depicts the power and the glory and the wonder of the cross of Jesus. So, Lord God, we just thank you this day. Bless us as we go in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Cheers.